today we are launching part one of our private parts series. And, uh, you know, we, we kind of, we've talked about this. We know uh, that every one of us, to some degree, has parts of our life that we like to keep private. Right? Right? There are areas of our life that we feel like, okay, like, we can let God in in this part, let God in in that part, let God in and even these parts. But these parts, a few of the parts of my life, I want to kind of keep private. I don't want to let God in. I don't want to let God work in those areas. And so we're going to be exploring over the next four weeks some of these parts that I believe that a lot of us like to keep private from God. You know, we say, we sang this song, I believe, I believe, but really the t- true test of believing that God, uh, believing for God to do things that are impossible in our life really could be defined as, let's look at all the parts of our life and let's look at, okay, is our entire life an open book to God? Or are we kind of closed off in certain parts of our life that maybe are uncomfortable? So we're going to explore some of those parts and super excited about next week. And we have a guest speaker coming. It's going to be honestly incredible. I was just sharing this in the first service that Fazl Malik's one of my favorite people. And uh, he's uh, a man of wisdom. And he's a businessman as well as a church planner in uh, British Columbia doing some incredible things out there. And around the world, a, a former Sunni Muslim who had an encounter with Jesus, totally changed his life. And, and he's just an incredible man, the kind of guy that I can sit and talk with for five, six hours. And, and it's just, he's, just, he's uh, exuding with wisdom, an incredible, incredible leader. Uh, in Canada. So you're going to want to be here. It's going to be awesome. I know it will encourage you. Invite your friends. Invite your neighbors. I know you won't regret it. But today, as we launch in part one of our series, and letting God in where the sun don't shine, that's the premise of this series, the sun Jesus Christ. Uh, We are talking about, if you're taking notes, the dailies. The dailies. Write that down on your notes. The dailies. Embracing the interruptions. Embracing the interruptions. How many of you know that every day there are moments when your life gets interrupted? I mean, you have a plan. How many hyper-focused people in here? Where you have like a plan, you have an agenda, you have a schedule, you're going to do A, B, C, D, E today. I mean, you get up and you have a plan. You're going to make this for breakfast, you're going to eat this for lunch, you're going to eat this for dinner. And then between all those points, you got everything planned, you're going to be at work at this time, you know. And then boom, something happens and an interruption takes place. You find out that on the 417 near Nicholas, there's a big reconstruction project, and, and now you've got to wait in line in traffic for hours, and you're going to be late, and you're not going to reach your destination on the time you plan to reach it. You're interrupted, and it's kind of like a daily thing. I mean, how many, how many can experience this kind of a thing, like, relatively every day? I mean, you have a plan. You have a good ideal. You're going to do, you're going to do it. You're going to make the best this day, the most productive day in your work schedule, and then just stuff happens. You know, maybe you get a flat tire, maybe your, your car runs out of gas. You know, maybe there's just, you forgot your lunch, so now you got to drive to find lunch, and you, it, it, it adds an extra, you know, a few, a few minutes to your break or something, or something happens, and it kind of like interrupts your flow. It interrupts your, your dynamic or your purpose. Well, I believe that the, the, the true test of spirituality is how much you let God into your everyday. I mean, you could say you're a spiritual person, you come to church on the weekend, and then kind of separate your spiritual life from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and say, well, I do my church thing, but I don't really want to let God into my daily life, because what does that really mean anyways? I mean, i got to do laundry, i got to cook, i got to clean, but can I really let God in in those moments, in those daily moments? You know, and I was thinking about this, and there's a man named Brother Lawrence. He was like a saint, lived on a monastery, prayed, gave his life for prayer, Really, and he wrote a book. There's a book that was written um, called "Practicing the Presence of God," and he was he was somebody that was known. He was he was really known for somebody who learned to incorporate God, the presence of God, into every part of life, into every mode of life into his chores into his when he was doing his gardening when he was doing the dishes and he he didn't really like the scheduling thing that this this, the the prayer schedule that they had to do on the monastery he didn't really like that he didn't he wanted to kind of go against the grain of the culture and so what ended up happening was is he learned to cultivate an attitude or a heart posture uh, inside of him where he learned to embrace God in every situation in the daily chores 
of life. Can we get the lights on, please? Uh, a daily chores of life. And, and what ended up happening was he was known, he was actually known as the man who glowed while he did the dishes. He was the man who know, it was known that he was the man who glowed. And people literally, if you read his book, Practicing the Presence of God, he, he, people would come from around the world just to watch him do dishes. Because he would glow in the presence of God. Because he so learned to incorporate the presence of God into every daily activity of his life that it was reflected in his daily duties. And that's kind of what I feel like God wants us to learn and grow in is that God wants to be a part of your every day. What does that mean? You know, what does it mean, part of your every day? Like, how do you let God in to do your, you know, God's not going to do your dishes for you. God's not going to do your laundry for you. I mean, I would love that. God send an angel, fold all my laundry, do all my dishes. I mean, all that kind of stuff. I mean, I feel, I feel like, you know, dishwashers are like heavenly. I mean, they're, they're heaven sent. I mean, they, 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 it makes things a lot easier, right? Thank God for dishwashers. If you, if, you, if you ever feel discouraged in life, just thank God for your dishwasher. That's enough to be thankful for, you know? Um, but, but I, you know, I, I really what I want to talk about today is I think one of the most important realities that I believe our lives are interrupted with every day, and it has to do with people. Now, let's pick it up in Luke 10, Luke 10, verse 25 out of the New Living Translation, okay? I want to start here as the base point of this whole message. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? This is a man who knew the law. I mean, he, some translations would call him a lawyer. Often the religious teachers of the law were called lawyers. They just, they knew the law from the back of the book to the front of the book. You know, they just knew everything. They were like the spiritual, uh, uh, the spiritual authority in that culture. You know, they just, they knew everything they needed to know. And, and yet their hearts were really far away still from the whole reality of relationship. But one day an expert... And religious law stood up and test, tested Jesus by asking him this question, Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, What does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. The lawyer said, Right! Or sorry, Jesus said, Right! Jesus told him, Do this and you will live. Verse 29, The man... The lawyer wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Because you see, in the lawyer's mind, he thought, okay, for sure there's got to be uh, an exclusion. There's got to be some sort of like, clause in the contract. Like, I can't love everybody. I can't love everybody. I mean, even in our culture, I mean, Jews don't associate with Samaritans. There are certain people in society that we Jews do not associate with. We don't really associate with Gentiles. That's why they got all upset when they found out that Jesus was hanging out with prostitutes, hanging out with drunks, hanging out with gluttons, hanging out with corrupt tax collectors. They got their panties in a knot because, hey, that didn't fit their religious grid for what they were supposed to do, what they were supposed to look like. And so they got everything all twisted and they got upset about it. And so here's this guy trying to justify and say, oh, there's got to be a loophole in the system. I mean, I, I get that. I mean, I believe the law, and I, I can fulfill the law by simply loving God with all my heart and loving my neighbor. But, like, show me the clause in the contract here because I can't love everybody because even in our social, the way that our social system has been set up, I mean, I gotta, we got to keep our reputation. We can't hang out with some of these guys. We can't hang out with the people on the street. I mean, it, is, it, is, it, it slimes us a certain way. That's what they were kind of saying without saying it. So he's trying to get Jesus to, to give him an out, and he had a motive, a wrong motive behind it. And I'm going to pick it up later on. But basically what I want to say is this. That the core of what I want you to get today is that the greatest interruptions in life often are centered around people. The greatest God moments or potential God experiences that you could have that will change your life are interrupted into your life through people. And really, if we don't get this whole concept of loving God and loving the people around us truly, when those people interrupt our lives, we will miss a God opportunity if we don't embrace the interruption. There are moments, I'm not saying that, you know, you, you have a plan and you got to let everybody, you know, interrupt you all the time and abort. But there are certain God interruptions, I believe, that if we're open, God will use those things to change our life, to grow us up so we can grow out. How many know that we have to, in our relationship with God, we're constantly growing up into the person we're called to be? 
And as we grow up into the person we're called to be according to his standard, what ends up happening is we end up growing out into the person we're called to be. That means we're impacting the culture now. That means we're impacting our families, our workplace. That means we're actually doing something with great purpose other than just getting a paycheck and paying the bills. We're actually leaving a mark on culture. We grow up in God so we can grow out to impact the world around us. That is why we grow up in God. We don't grow up in God just so we can sit in a closet and pray 24 hours a day. There is a greater purpose to your life than just that. It's to actually make a mark on society. Which is what Lindsay even shared about at Matthew 10. It was the whole commission to go and do some awesome things that represent heaven to showcase the fact that, hey, I'm still alive. And, and this is for us as well to this day. That Jesus is alive and he's working and wants to work through us. But we have to get this. I wrote this down. Write this down on your notes. If you're taking notes. Selfishness excludes interruptions. But selflessness embraces them. You know, think about some things right now in your life that you're constantly being interrupted by. Maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe you come out. Maybe you're not a morning. How many morning people in here? How many non-morning people in here? Like you're just like you're just like Oscar the Grouch in the morning, and it's okay. I mean, the first step is accepting that you are Oscar the Grouch. The next step is now doing something about it, right? But, you know, you may want to be, you're the kind of person, you get up and you want to leave to work. You don't want to talk to anybody. You want to get in a conversation. But every time you go out of your garage or out of your door in the morning to go to work, to get into your car, your neighbor's out there almost like he's waiting to talk to you. He's like the neighbor that just waits to have a conversation because maybe he's kind of lonely. He doesn't have anybody to talk to. And you're the only person he knows you're going to come out every morning at 7 a.m. But you're not a morning person. And you're kind of being, you're being interrupted. Like your, your moment, your, the moment for you to get over your grouchiness is being interrupted. And, and over and over again, and you actually fear getting out of your, your house to go into your car because you don't want that interruption. But what if that interruption is a godsend to grow your kindness? To grow your gentleness, to grow your love for people. And as you allow and embrace those daily moments where God is interrupting you, you end up growing up so you can grow out in life. And you can impact more people. God wants you to bear more fruit on your tree. Some of you like are a lopsided tree. You got a lot of fruit over here. Like you got the joy, you got the peace, but you're just really unkind. You're just not gentle. And so the gentle fruit and the kind fruit is like just not there. But you got a lot of peace, a lot of joy, but you don't have the other side of it. God wants to balance you out. And so God puts you into situations where he can grow you up so he can grow you out and interrupts you daily until you get it. But we're like rejecting God and saying, I don't want that. I don't like it, you know. And you justify and say, well, it's like the lawyer did. Well, there's got to be exceptions, God. Like, I don't have to love everybody. I mean, come on, God. Like, I'm allowed to be grouchy at least just in the morning. There's got to be an exception. There's got to be exception to the rule. Like, I don't have to always be kind, do I? Well, yeah, you don't have to. You get to. You get to be kind. You get to be full of joy. Now, I know it's hard. I mean, because one of my struggles is I'm a hyper-focused person. So I, like, I streamline and laser focus in seasons of my life. And, and at times what ends up happening, there are people around me that feel like, wow, he just doesn't even notice that I'm there. You know, there was a season where, you know, people were saying, well, Sean's just not very nice. He just walks down the hall. He doesn't even look at me. But, you know, sometimes I just don't have time to get into a conversation with everybody for half an hour. Especially before a service. I, I love having conversations. But sometimes I'm painted as this, this like, bad guy because I'm, I'm on a mission. I got a task. And there are moments where I have to be open to those interruptions, but there are also moments where I have to be wise as well. Just like you do too. And you can't be in condemnation because, every, you know, the reality of it is if you're going to do anything in this world that's going to change the, change the world, not everyone's going to like you. And you got to accept that. Not everyone's going to like you. You know, you will have the lovers and you will have the haters. It kind of goes with the, the, the game. It goes with leadership. But we have to still be open daily to say, hey, God, like, is this, an, is this a God moment? Is this a God interruption? Because if it is, I know there could be a God experience in this moment that's a game changer, not only for me, but for the person that I'm talking to. I, I want you to close your eyes for a second. And I want you to imagine this big do not disturb sign on your forehead. Now open your eyes. Now just to think about this, this is that that picture that you just had is what a lot of people see when they see you. Maybe you give off a vibe that you're just like a do not disturb person. You're like maybe you're to yourself. Maybe you kind of give off a vibe like that. And 
and whether it's true or not is really irrelevant. People see many people like that. Because maybe, you know, you're, you're, you're having a tough day and you just don't want to be bothered. You don't, wanna, you don't even want to be asked, how are you doing, you know? You don't even want to be asked that question. You're just tired. And I, I know that for me, I, you know, when I first started traveling and I was doing only international stuff in the beginning. I was only traveling overseas. That was the, the first. So I kind of, I, I wasn't like I was traveling just like in, from city to city in Ontario. My traveling lifestyle started international speaking. And so I, I was getting all these invitations overseas and letting, having to learn to adapt to new time frames, cultures, people, different, you know, different, you know, uh, people groups, uh, churches, environments, schools. I mean, different things that I was doing, speaking at. I remember in the beginning, I really didn't know what balance was. And so, I mean, I'd go hard in the very beginning. We'd go for like a 10-day stint or a three-week stint sometimes. I'm staying in people's homes back in that time before I really realized that wasn't the healthiest thing for me and staying in people's homes. So it was always pretty chaotic, pretty busy. There'd be times when we'd do these outreaches and we'd be on the street setting up these booths, praying for people for five, six hours straight, and then doing meetings at night, meetings in the morning, meetings in the afternoon, meeting with people, having conversations to get back to the house when you're staying at the host home. I mean, just, it was crazy. And there were moments when I just needed to decompress. I need to, like, I had to put that just don't, do not disturb sign on my head. And I hope people discerned it, but most people don't discern it so I you know you end up you end up like having to to adapt and embrace those interruptions even in the moments where you feel like you deserve no interruption but how many know this and I believe this to be true that and I've learned this over the years that some of the greatest moments of power in my life or life transformation have been in the greatest moments of weariness the greatest moments of weakness because then in those moments when you're so weak, you just literally have nothing left to give, you're, you feel empty, then it's like you're, it, the entirety of your faith is reliant on God's power and grace in you, nothing to do with your own strength. It's a beautiful thing, actually. You learn to embrace those interruption moments because the, that's when the most beautiful part of who you really are comes out. There's, not, there's, not, there's no mixture. You, know, you, you can look at someone and say, wow, that's the strength of God. That's not just their personality, their, their giftedness, their talent. That's the strength of God. As I know how hard they've been pushing. I don't know how they, they're doing this right now. That's the strength of God. I love those moments. But you have to learn to, to recognize those moments when they're, when they're, when they're here. And, and I would literally have these moments. My greatest, the first, when I first started traveling, those moments were at the highest for me on the plane flying home from some place. And I always thanked God because I, back then I had elite status on one of the airlines. And I always thanked God when I had business class. I get these upgrades or whatever. And I remember when they made the, the new cubicles for Air Canada. Anybody ever sat in the cubicles? Anybody ever sat in the cubicles? No? Oh, yeah, a few of you. They had made these cubicles. I remember when they first came out, they had, like, like beds you can lay, lay flat. They had, like, a back massager on them. I mean, it was just awesome, you know, and big, bigger TVs. And um, I just remember those moments. And like, yeah, I get to, like, enjoy myself. And then you kind of, like, close your eyes, disconnect. And then somebody, your neighbor asks you a question. And then you get into a conversation, you know. And it's like, okay, you know that once you get into a conversation, especially about anything spiritual, it's going to go three, four hours probably, and for me, that's how it always would go. And so I would, I would try to pretend that I don't even notice anybody else. I got like the disturb sign on. I'm like, I'm just so tired. I've talked to hundreds of people all week. I literally, I feel like I'm burnt out. I'm empty. I got nothing left to give. And then God's like, hey, God opportunity. You're so weak, Sean. Now I'm going to use my strength in you, through you. So get ready to be selfless in this moment. Learning how to love my neighbor as myself in those moments. Because I really, in those moments, all I wanted was rest for myself but what about these people around me that maybe needed something that I had to give them and so I had to learn to embrace these interruption moments and I remember I was flying from uh, somewhere in the U.S. through Ottawa to Newfoundland and it was a, a relatively long air, <coughs> airplane trip and I was flying and I just wanted some space I was really tired I've been traveling a lot at that point really tired I wanted a break I sat beside this woman probably in her th late 30s and we began to have a conversation. She asked me, and I was really hoping to disconnect, and so she started talking to me. And so she asked me, she's like, what do you do? We started talking, and, I, and then it, it, the conversation came up as to why she was going to Newfoundland. She said, I'm going to Newfoundland because I'm going to a psychic fair to get two of my dreams interpreted. So I'm like, this is a perfect opportunity because, I mean, I teach on that. At this point, that's all I taught on was the supernatural. 
how to experience the supernatural in your life and how to understand the language of God and interpret your dreams and hear the voice of God. And that was like my world, you know. And, and so I'm like, oh, God, thank you for the opportunity and the interruptions. I know that I can't ignore this one, you know. And so I'm like, hey, well, I said, tell me your dreams. I said, I believe that because I believe in Jesus. I believe that he speaks and I believe that I can interpret your two dreams for you. So tell me your dreams. She began to tell me her dreams, and over the process of I don't know how many minutes of conversation, God began to speak to her through through uh, through the the dream and gave her the interpretation. She got totally rocked, totally impacted. And I remember she telling me she she was telling me this you near know, the end of the conversation. She was like, "I actually got everything right now that I was going to the psychic fair to get," and she said these exact words to me: "I don't need to go to the psychic fair anymore." I'm like. Thank God for that interruption. Because if, imagine if I had ignored that interruption, missed an opportunity. She would have went to that psychic fair and maybe got a totally skewed version of what her dreams, you know, meant. Probably would have. And I thank God for those moments. And I've learned over the years that if you want to be a person that walks daily with God, that allows God daily into your life, you're going to have to embrace the interruptions. And it's going to be inconvenience. It's going to feel like an inconvenience at times. It's going to frustrate you at times. It's going to irritate you at times. Because God never said like everybody. He said love everybody. Right? He said love everybody. And love is, is, is a state of being when it comes to the truth of something. When you love somebody, you don't always have to feel like loving them. Love is, love is a choice. It's a choice we make. But we don't always have to feel that, oh, I like this scenario. But no, but I so love God, I so love people that I'm willing to sacrifice what I feel in the moment for this individual. Right? How you guys doing? I really want to talk about, it's really simple today, this message. And I hope you get something from it. But I just believe the most powerful interruptions in life have to do with people. Now let's pick it up in Luke 10 again. And the latter part of this passage we opened up with. So it ends like the lawyer saying, well, there's got to be an exception. Tell me the exception to the rule. I can't love everybody because, you know, us Jews, we don't associate with the Samaritans. So Jesus responds to the lawyer with a story. It says in verse 30, a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him off of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, I love that. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. Interesting, isn't it? Here's a guy, he's off duty. He's a priest, has duties within the temple at that time. You know, very active, taking care of the people. But now he's off duty. And how many know, like, kind of like, that's what we do, right? Whether it's spiritually, whether it's on our work, we're, when we leave work, when we clock out, it's like we're off duty, we're off duty. But what about the time when you're off duty, you've clocked out at your job, and your manager calls you because he needs, he needs you? And you say, well, I don't have to pick up my phone because, you know what, I'm off. I put my hours in. But what if that moment is the beginning of a promotion for you? Because you don't let, and it might be a God thing, that if you, because you don't, you kind of segregated, you've kind of separated, you know, every, you kind of like, okay, this is my work, this is my family life or this is my life but what about that moment that could be a god moment you've been praying for breakthrough you've been praying for financial breakthrough here's a manager calling you probably asking you to pick up a shift or save the day and you're purposely not answering your phone after you prayed god help me show me the money god's like okay manager calls you maybe you don't like him very much but you ignore the phone call that's kind of what we do with god we're like, God, do some awesome things in our life. Great purpose, great dreams, and God gives us an opportunity, and we ignore it. We've shut off the priest and has this charge to, to be the, the representation of God to people and to minister to God and minister to people. And he literally, he leaves the temple doors. He clocks out and is on the street and sees somebody in need and actually, to make it even more awkward, walks to the other side of the street and completely ignores the Jewish man. One of his own. One of his own people. Then it says in verse 32, then a temple assistant, which would have, been a, would have been a Levite, a temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there. This is right after. But he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Did you hear that? A despised Samaritan. 
one of the most unlikely people, even for the Samaritan and for the Jew, that whole scenario was just not socially normal. It was not socially normal. Even in John 4, when Jesus sat down at the well with the Samaritan woman, all his disciples are like, what are you doing? We got to go eat. You know, we shouldn't even go through here. What are you doing? Why are you sitting? I mean, you're, 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 you're like offending our social culture right now. You're offending, you know, the, 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 the system that's been created. I don't understand. But Jesus came to introduce some new rules. He introduced a whole new game. He introduced a whole new game. He became a bridge to all people, all mankind. You with me? So this despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he had compassion for him. This is verse 34. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. Verse 35. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins telling him take care of this man if the bill runs higher than this I will pay you the next time I'm here now which of these three now this is Jesus talking to the lawyer which of these three people or situations would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits Jesus asked the man replied the one who showed him mercy then Jesus said yes now go and do the same it's funny because Jesus didn't even answer the lawyer's original question he answered the lawyer with a story so that the lawyer could hear his own answer out of his own mouth. If Jesus can get you to figure out the answer, you're all of a sudden held accountable to that answer. If he can hear you say the answer to the question that you asked God because you've been through a situation or experienced something that gave you the answer, then all of a sudden in that moment, you're held accountable to it. You said it. You've confessed it. You know it. You have no excuse anymore. It's funny because we, sometimes in prayer, right, we'll like pursue heaven and we'll ask God a question. God, you got to do something about the situation with my son, my daughter, my work, or this or that, or whatever. My neighbor, they're bothering me. I mean, do something, you know. And then God puts us into a situation where we can figure out the answer ourselves. God's not going to always come with a lightning bolt and an angel and a scroll with the answer written on a page. He's not going to always answer you through biblical roulette where you like, God, speak to me, God, speak to me, God, speak to me, God, speak to me. Bam! You know, and God speaks to you. He's not going to do that all the time. It could happen, and it happens. And it, but that's not, you can't rely on that method. There are many times, much of the time, you ask God a question. Okay, God's like, okay, here's an opportunity. I'm going to send you into a situation where you can figure out the answer. Because once you figure out the answer, it will transform your life. This lawyer gets a revelation that, hey, there are no uh, exclusions in this whole matter. i got to love everybody. Just like that Samaritan, that despised Samaritan that went against the grain, the social norm of that day. He went and he, he just showed compassion on them. I want to give you three things that we learn through the daily interruptions of our life. Number one, number one is we learn sacrifice. Write that down. We learn sacrifice. And really oftentimes it's around time, money, and around people. We sacrifice for people, we sacrifice for time, and we sacrifice our money. Those are three big sacrifices that we learn daily with God. If we, if we want to grow up and grow out God, and, and to mature in God, and grow out in God to impact this world around us, we have to be able to embrace these elements of sacrifice. Time, people, and money. Very, very, very important. Our daily sacrifice, something that we go through every day. And how many know time is a big deal? I mean, the Samaritan that was despised had a mission. He was going somewhere. Maybe he had a plan. Maybe he had to be at his mother-in-law's for dinner at a certain time, right? And he's walking along, and this is a highly inconvenient moment for him. And in fact, it doesn't even make sense for him to even pay attention to it because they don't associate. God interrupts the Samaritan and also interrupts the Jew because even the Jewish man that was lying there half dead probably thought to himself too, hey, this is like not normal. Like a Samaritan should not be taking care of me. Like the priest, the Levite, the temple assistant, he should have been taking care of me. Now here's the guy that, I'm not supposed to be associated with this guy. I mean, this is my reputation at hand. God interrupts the Jewish man and he interrupts the Samaritan on the way somewhere. He had an agenda. He had a purpose. A purpose. He had a sacrifice. Not only his reputation possibly or sacrifice other things in his life, but also sacrifice his time to help this individual how many of you feel like they've had those moments and have those moments daily you know I, I really believe this you guys like we're not called to live uh, a relationship with God only on the weekend 
Like, you say, like, you want people, I, I talk to, you know, people that have been in the church for a long time, believers that have been, you know, from many different churches, and they, and they, and they come, and they want, you know, like, we, we want freedom, we don't want an agenda and a service, we want the Holy Spirit to lead, and I have these conversations with these individuals, and I know, I know through these conversations that they don't allow the Holy Spirit to lead them five, the six other days of their week. They only want God to lead them in a service, in church. I'm like, have you ever even, like, prayed for your neighbor? Have you ever even done anything kind for your neighbor? In fact, you might be the person that, like, you know, wants the freedom in church, but then like, your neighbor comes asking for help, and you're like, no. But God's interrupting you. You say you don't want, you don't want an agenda. Well, hey, your agenda is being interrupted every day during the week, but you're not thinking that that, that that even could be God. You come into church, you want the freedom, but hey, if you, don't find, if you can't find the freedom daily in your life, you're never going to have freedom in church. And I learned this. This was the beginnings of my life. In the beginning, that's all we did. I mean, I, I, my, I learned how to hear the voice of God on the street. I'd go out there and sit at a coffee shop and just write on a napkin for a waitress or for a person behind the desk what God, I felt like God was saying. And I began to practice hearing the voice of God out there. That's where I learned the freedom of hearing the voice of God. Then it just got better in the church. It just got better. It got easier. But I learned out there because I wanted so, I so bad wanted God to invade the dailies of my life, the activities of my life, because I knew he was a God of 24 hours a day. He wasn't a God of the weekend. He was the God of the 24 hours a day, every day, seven days a week. And I remember I was at a conference one time. We were hosting a conference. It was a really long conference. It was like a nine-session conference. And I don't know which session. Maybe we were in session seven or something, and maybe it was a Friday night. I can't remember if it was Saturday or Friday, and it was a long day, and we had to be back at the church the next morning at like eight. It was like back in the day, we were leaving the church at like 12 a.m., 1 a.m. in the morning at times, and uh, so I remember, you know, leaving the, the church and like thinking, okay, I got to go to sleep. I mean, I, I, I got to, no more sacrificing my time, you know. I got to go to sleep, and, and yet I'm praying, God, make me a man of God, and I want to let you into every daily moment. I never want to miss you. You know, we pray those prayers. God, use me, speak to me, all these different things. And I'm driving. It's like 1 a.m. in the morning. I'm driving up one of the main roads near where I live, and I'm driving up. It's super late in the morning, and there's these three guys that are walking on the shoulder. These three guys that are walking up the shoulder. Two of them look drunk. They're kind of staggering a little bit. And uh, they were near a pub, near, like, it, it was, they were coming out near a, a pub, so I, I just figured, put two and two together. So I'm driving, and I heard the Holy Spirit scream my name. Now, I've never at this point heard the Holy Spirit scream, and the Holy Spirit does scream. It was loud, it was scary, and it was shocking to get my attention. I'm always tired. I mean, if you're tired, the Holy Spirit has to scream to wake you up. So I'm tired, I'm driving. I heard the Holy Spirit scream my name, and he began to tell me, I want you to go back, and I want you to talk to these people. I got a word for them. So I'm like, I totally do not want to do this. Like, it's super late. I am tired. I got to get up the next morning. I do not want to sacrifice my time. But yet, hey, God, use me, speak to me. Because we pray those prayers, right? Like, we want to hear the voice of God. But then God speaks to you, and you're like, you chicken out, right? So, or, or you're just tired, right? And for me, it was I was just tired at that point. So selfish, felt selfish, you know, and felt justified being selfish. Like, almost like the lawyer. You know, there's got to be like a, a, an exclusion. God, I don't have to always be on, do I? Come on, like, give me a break. So I, I, I keep going, and that, that feeling, that weight gets heavier and heavier. And I know over the years when I don't listen, I know what it feels like not to listen. So I couldn't bear the weight of it. So I, I, I drove back, pulled it up, three-point turn on a main road, came back, parked, I passed by them because I didn't want to make them feel like I was like, doing some sort of like sketchy drive-by or whatever, like stalking them. So I came back, parked my car on the shoulder, and I ran up towards them. And so it just looked, the whole scenario looked funny. But anyways, I went up towards them, like, hey! And I called her, I called out to them, and I said, listen, I said, I, and this is really weird. I was driving, and I, I just believe that God speaks today, and I believe that God told me to stop, because something, something, God wants to do something in your life. And so I don't remember how I worded everything, but I began to talk to them, and began to open up the conversation, and found out, like, two of them were kind of a little bit drunk, which drunk people are always easy to talk to. I love talking to drunk people. Because you can just, like, you're, like, sowing spiritual seed into them. We've seen people sober up in a moment. Many times, like they sober up in a moment. So, I mean, it, don't 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 feel like oh God can't speak to the drunk. Yeah, we've seen it happen many times, like total transformation. Uh, but anyway, so I'm talking to these guys, and one of the guys who was sober, I kind of like aimed down on, on him first, and I God began to give me a word for him, and so I began to share the word with him, and then I got the other guy's attention, even though they were drunk. They're kind of like, whoa, this is weird, you know. And they were kind of drunk, so they're like, oh, this is cool, man. They're like, you know, you know. And so I said, listen, I believe God wants to do something powerful in your life, and so I'm gonna. 
I want to pray for you right now. Something's going to happen. I think you had an issue. I think I had a word about a condition in his stomach, actually, uh, in his digestive tract or something. I can't remember what it was. Or maybe it was asthma. I think it was asthma, actually. And so anyway, we began to pray. The power of God hit this guy. I mean, he was, like, really touched by the power of God. As a result, the two other guys that were watching were super intrigued. I got to share the gospel with them. And they had this encounter with Jesus at 1.30 a.m. in the morning on the shoulder of a road coming out of a pub. Why? Why? Because I simply chose to embrace the interruption in the moment. Because God wants to be involved in your daily life. But we got to be open. we got to be open to listen to God and not be so selfish and sacrifice our time. The Samaritan had to do this. He was interrupted. Number two, second thing we learn is selflessness. 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 I I want to read this scripture out of 1 John 4. I love it. It kind of, I believe, helps us define better what love looks like and love in context to our relationship with God. We talk about, you know, this whole commandment to love our neighbor as ourselves. Well, 1 John 4, go there, or you can read it on the screen, and verse 7 says, My beloved friends, let us continue to love each other since love comes from God. Everyone who knows or everyone who loves is born of God and experiences a relationship with God. The person who refuses to love doesn't know the first thing about God. Because this is the thing, you guys, I believe you cannot, you cannot not love your neighbor if you say you love God. There's a disconnect there. If you say you love God, then it should be reflected in how you treat people around you. You know, when your neighbor comes to your door to borrow some sugar, your first thought isn't like, oh, you're such an inconvenience. You know what I mean? No, it should be like, hey, this is an opportunity where I can be kind. Because kindness is one of the fruit, fruits of love. This is an opportunity where I can be an example, a representative of heaven, just simply by giving them sugar. You know, but maybe you had a plan. You were going to use that last bit of sugar to make your favorite brownies. And all of a sudden, you got to sacrifice and be selfless in that moment and say, hey, what? I don't need those brownies, you know. I've been eating a lot of Christmas cookies. I can do without. I can sacrifice the brownies tonight and give my leftover sugar to this neighbor. I know that's a funny example. But I, I, uh, I don't want to read more of that scripture because I, I think you guys can go reference it. But I want to, just for the sake of time, I want to keep going here. I was in a... I want to share testimonies today because I feel like it's very important that you, you hear some testimonies that connect to this. Because I, I really, this is one of the things that I, in my book, if you read it, Secrets of the Supernatural Life, the whole purpose of that book is to t help give you, if you haven't read it, I encourage you to read it, get it in the lobby, to give you the practical tools of how to let God in into your daily life like this. That book is all around that, helping you understand how God wants to be involved in your daily life and interrupt you and, and how the supernatural wants to touch every part of your life and how that looks like in your workplace, how it looks like in your family, how it looks like doing your day-to-day -day stuff. And so I want to encourage you to read that book. That's why I wrote it. But uh, I was in the U.K. ministering. I believe it was England. And, uh, and you know, I was uh, really tired, really kind of empty, felt like I just needed a break. I'd been ministering like day after day after day, and I was staying at a host home, and I was trying to get some privacy, working on my stuff for the next day. You know, I had my laptop, and, uh, and, and the power went out in the house. Electricity went out, and my computer wasn't charged back in the day when I had a Toshiba, really dysfunctional Toshiba that couldn't keep a charge. So my computer wasn't, wasn't functioning unless it was plugged in. And so, you know, I had no computer, couldn't work on my stuff, frustrated, uh, you know, a little inconvenienced, disturbed, interrupted. This is why I don't like staying at people's houses when I travel, like that kind of thing, you know. And, uh, and so they had to call an electrician to come to the house. And so the electrician comes to the house, and the moment he walks in, I'm like, oh, this is why I was interrupted. Because he comes in the house, and immediately God begins to speak to me about his daughter. I didn't know he had a daughter. God begins to speak to me about his daughter. And so I'm, I'm seeing this guy, and I'm seeing his daughter, and I'm seeing this whole situation in my, in my mind's eye. And God begins to speak to me, and I'm like, this is why I was interrupted. God interrupted him by interrupting us. He thought he was just coming to help fix the electricity. But really, you know, God was going to come and fix some of the things in his life and encourage him. And strengthen him. And so I began to share this word with them. And tears began to well up in his eyes. He began to cry. We prayed for him. He had an encounter with Jesus in that moment. God in interrupted his life because of an interruption in my life. And you don't, see, we don't always realize that 
those interruptions that you are facing day after day could be the greatest experiences of transformation for somebody else if you just follow along and you let God take you on a journey don't reject them when they come it's daily it's a daily thing number three my last point the last thing that we, we learn daily is working out our salvation what do I mean by that well when you have an encounter with Jesus for the first time you let him into your life to lead your life in that moment it's not the end it's a beginning for you and then every day after that, you are working out. You are growing up every day in Christ. You are growing up understanding more and more about what this whole salvation experience is really all about. Why Jesus really came to give you life. Why he's already given you life. And what that looks like throughout the years of your life that you have left on earth. And how it's going to transpire into your purpose, your destiny, your dreams, your job, your workplace. All those different variables in your life. It's so important that we understand that every day of our life, the dailies of our life, God is working out these things. He's growing us up into a greater knowledge of who he is so he can grow us out into impacting the world around us. And I, I remember this, this story, one of my favorite stories I used to always share in my schools was back in, in Mexico. Back in Mexico, I, I was in Mexico years ago and uh, we were doing this extensive uh, ministry missions trip and and I remember being, being there and, and, you know, once again, like kind of like feeling like, you know, I was tired a little bit when I relaxed. We were at the resort at the night uh, after the meetings and we were hanging out in the pool, a bunch of us. We're all having a good time in the pool, hanging out, just talking and uh, getting to know some people that were from different places around the world that were there. And we're talking and this young girl, probably in her early 20s, comes down with a bottle of a, four, a 40 of tequila in her hand. And, she, and she's like, hey, you know, I got this 40 of tequila. I'm not going to finish it. I'm not going to drink it. Do you want it? I'm leaving tomorrow morning on a flight to go home. And the first thought in my mind was, no, we don't want your tequila. We have our own tequila. We can give it to you, and it's free. And his name is Jesus Christ. He's better than tequila. He's better than any drink you're ever going to drink. That was the thought going into my mind. And so, um, you know, because, I mean, she's got her God, or vodka. We got our vodka. You know, we, we, we got it. We're on tap. It's on tap all the time. And he's the best bartender in the world. He doesn't even need a tip except for the tithe. Uh, but anyway, so we, uh, <laughs> uh, we, 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 um, so I began to explain to her, I began to explain to her that, like, listen, like, we, you know, you know we don't want that. Thank you for the offer, but, but we got something even better that we can give you. It's, a be, it's better than tequila, actually. And we began to explain. So she kind of came, became wide-eyed, you know. She's like, okay, what are you going to tell me? Like, this is really weird, you know. And so we began to talk to her about, like, what we've been, been experiencing during the week. Because the best thing you can do is share a testimony of something that God's been doing in your life. Hey, we just saw this person of whatever condition healed last night. I mean, they couldn't walk, and they walked for the first time in 15 years. You know, like, I mean, you can't really argue with that. You can argue theology all you want. You can debate. But if you can debate somebody into the kingdom, somebody else will debate them out of the kingdom. So the best thing to do is talk about what God does, who he is, testimonies, how he's changed your life. And so we're beginning to talk to her about what God was doing and who he is and what he's like and how awesome he is. And so I said this. I said to her, I said, listen, I believe right now that I could lay my hand on you and you will experience the power of God. Do you want that? Better than the, the tequila in your hand. I mean, this is going to totally outshine that tequila. There's no drink better than the drink, Jesus Christ, you know. And he's about to give you a big drink. So he began to, and she kind of was like at first a little bit, but I explained it well to her, right? So I kind of, I brought her from like a wide eye to like, okay, I understand, you know. So she kind of closed her eyes. She had no grid. This girl, no grid of who God is. No grid. Like, this is so random for her. All these like guys. I mean, I, I kind of had big long dreadlocks. I mean, we looked like we were the partiers drinking the tequila. To her probably, you know. We're just having a good Holy Ghost time in the pool, you know. And so she gets totally interrupted. She interrupts us. We interrupt her, her mode of, of reference. And so we begin to pray for her. The moment we put our hand on her, it was like, like the power of God came all over her body and she began to shake it was like electricity went through her body she had her eyes closed at the time and she opens up her eyes and she starts saying what's happening to me what's happening oh my gosh she's like what's happening she's freaking out I think she's swearing she's like what's going on what the this is crazy you know and, and, and we were like that's the power of God this is to show you and demonstrate to you that like this Jesus thing I mean it's for real man I mean it's real it's real. It's so real. He's showing you that he's better than that tequila in that bottle. You know, you don't need God vodka. You need some vodka. 
And this is that moment right now. Just take another sip, you know. And she was getting totally rocked, totally messed up. I mean, she was totally. And so at that moment, she let Jesus into her life. She opened up her heart. Her whole countenance changed, gave her life to Jesus. I mean, it was so awesome. I think about these moments that we've had over and over again over the years. And there are always moments when you're the weakest. You're writing that don't disturb sign on your forehead. You're weary. You're tired. But then God comes and interrupts you. Because you prayed that prayer, God, take everything, you know. You prayed that prayer, God, speak to me, use me. I don't want to just, like, exist. God, do something with my life. You prayed that prayer. So watch out. It's dangerous. God's going to bring you into some awesome experiences. But you got to be open to the daily moments. The daily moments. I love it. It says in Mark 1. I'm going to close with the scripture. It says with Mark 1. Verse 16 to 19 says, One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew coming or throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Verse 17, Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. This is the first disciple. This is Peter, Simon Peter. This is the guy that stood up on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit, you know, came in power. And opened up his mouth and said what was happening. And 3,000 people had an encounter that day with Jesus. This is the guy that was one of the beginners of the church as we know it. This is a guy along with the other 11 that changed the world as we know it. And this is the beginning. So they're doing their thing. I mean, they're doing their daily activity. They're working. They're fishing. They're doing a good thing. But Jesus comes along one day and says, hey, bro. You don't know me. I know everything about you, and I got something really awesome for you. Hey, you're fishing right now. You're catching fish to feed people. But hey, what about catching some spiritual fish and to begin to feed people spiritually? What, what, about, what about that? I, I got a plan for you beyond just catching actual fish. I'm going to teach you how to actually bring people into an experience that's going to change the life and it's going to change the world. And, and, and to do that, you have to let me interrupt you. Because you see, Peter and Andrew had to respond. They were busy cleaning their nets, doing their thing, fishing. And it wasn't even a hesitation. I love how it words it. In, in, in Mark, it says, verse 17, Jesus called out to them, come follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. Isn't that awesome? Because there was something in them that was yearning for a greater purpose a greater destiny. Something in them that knew that, hey, even though they were untrained, they were unschooled fishermen, that none of the other rabbis in the community wanted because they didn't have the education. They knew something was different about them on the inside probably. And so when Jesus came and Jesus connected those words, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men with their purpose, they knew, I'm all in. I'm jumping in. I know my destiny and my future is attached to that man right there that called me because he invited me. He interrupted me and I'm going to embrace the interruption doing my daily work. And because of that one choice, the church as we know it exists today. These disciples that embraced the interruption when Jesus called them changed the world. Why don't you stand up with me? Maybe you're in this room right now and you... Just close your eyes just for a few moments. I, I want you to think about this for, for a few moments. You have, isu- you have issues maybe in your life that you're f- facing, struggles. You have things that are happening over and over again to you that you know can't be coincidences. They're probably things that God wants to get your attention on. They're probably things that God's trying to highlight in your life. And they're, you, they feel like to you inter- like interruptions. Maybe your husband keeps asking you about the same thing over and over again. Or your wife keeps asking you about the same thing over and over again. Or about your kids maybe keep asking you about the same thing over and over again. And your response sometimes is like, I'm tired. Like, I just can't do that. I don't want to do this. It feels inconveniencing you. But maybe could it be that God's trying to get your attention. Maybe your boss, your manager at work keeps trying to push you further and harder and higher because he could see the potential in you, but all you interpret it as is like more work, more challenge, more time, more sacrifice, more selflessness. But what if it's God saying, hey, you wanted me to prosper you, 
and I put people in your life to help bring you along that journey of prosperity. And so I'm going to use this guy to promote you, but you have to let me interrupt your, your life. You have to let me take you through these moments of sacrifice and selflessness so that I can get you ready and grow you up in me so I can grow you out to impact the world around you. Maybe it's something else in your life that keeps coming up. Maybe, you know, something financially keeps happening to you over and over again, over and over again. You're like, God, like, what is this? And you feel like it's an interruption in your life. Why can I never be on time? Or why can I never pay the bill on time? Or why can I never do this and do that and never save and never, you know, really be consistent in my finances? Maybe God is highlighting something to you. Maybe you need to stop and think, okay, there's something I need to embrace. I need to embrace this moment and say, okay, God, help me to see what you're doing within the interruption in my life. I want you to invade every area of my life. I want to I wanna have a seven-day-a-week relationship with God. I don't want to want a weekend experience with God and then kind of go my, about my day Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I want, I want something more. But it takes you saying, okay, God, I want to, it takes you really opening up your heart and saying, I want to embrace the interruptions in my life.